Hi everybody, welcome back. So here's our next project, and this is one I've kind of been really excited to do. Uh, I've been wanting to have one of these on my bench for quite some time. and <laughs> Believe it or not, here it is. I have two of them on the bench that we're going to do both at the same time, or one right after the other. What these are is, these are called the Fisher 500 receiver. And it is a mono receiver. They're not stereo. They're built in, I believe they built them from 1957 to 1959, something around there. And there's some really unique features about them. And I've want, wanted one of these for a very long time, but good examples of them don't show up very often. When they do, uh, they're very expensive. And if, uh, if you do get one that's not too expensive, usually they're a real basket case, especially the face plates on them. And both of these have fairly decent face plates. This one more so than this. And this one actually has the cabinet, which has been repaired. It's not in the greatest of shape, but it's here. Very hard to find them with the original mahogany colored cabinets. So I was very excited when a really good friend of mine found these. And what, what we decided to do with them is I'm going to keep one of them. We're going to restore both of them. And then he's probably going to take it back and sell it. Uh, so one of these will probably end up for sale. Now, what's so unique about them? Well, first of all, these have, even though they're mono, they have a very good amplifier in them. E extremely good, as a matter of fact. Uh, they cover the full frequency spectrum, even beyond the audible frequency spectrum, and they're pretty flat. They use EL37 type tubes, or 5881s, or it can use 6L6s, depending, um, but it has that type of output. It's rated at about 30 watts, and it's very clean 30 watts, and they also mentioned that it can do peaks up to 65 watts. So these are really substantial amplifiers. They have a loudness contour, they have bass and treble controls. It was very carefully designed. So it's really neat. The other thing that's really neat about it is the phono stage. And yes, this has a really nice phono stage in it, even though it's mono. If you take a look down here, one of the things that is really unique about it is that it has different types of equalization because back at the time that these were being produced the RIAA had not become the absolute standard for phono equalization. So if you notice there are several different types, actually four different types of phono equalization. So if you have a, a record from that era that was recorded with a different type of equalization other than the RIAA standard, this will actually be able to select those. And you can play the record back exactly it was in, as it was intended to, be, to sound like at that time. I think that's really unique. Uh, it has two auxiliary inputs. It has AM and FM, and the tuner section is phenomenal in these. Unbelievable tuner. And when you look at the transformers, very large output transformer. I mean, this is a 30 watt amp, but look at the size of that transformer. Most, if you look at guitar amps and things, there's 60 and even 100 watt amps <laughs> that the transformers are no bigger than this. And look at the power transformer in this. So it has a very substantial power supply. It has two full wave bridge or full wave uh, rectifier tubes the 6x4, and this is a 5v4, I believe. So it has separate power supplies for the tuner and the line stage amplifier stage. It has a ferrite magnet, which was a pretty unique thing at its time. And it has a very accurate tuning meter, which is adjustable. And it even has the output for the multiplex module, which I'm going to talk to my friend who uh, acquired these, and I think he and I are going to do a little project and see if we can find one of those multiplex modules. I would love to be able to do one of those to go along with these. 
This one here has an original set of Tung Sol Made in USA 5881 tubes. And I think this one has a little newer set of output tubes. I'm not sure what they are. This one was sold, if I understood correctly, this one was sold as is for parts. This one was a working model and my friend actually heard it work and it sounded very good. It was working. So we don't know if it's been recapped. We don't know what's been done to any of these. But we're just going to go through and because these have a special place in my heart, I'm going to go through and really do them. Uh, well, why do I like these so much? Well, other than the historical significance of them and the uniqueness of the design of them, uh, when I was growing up, a lot of the electronics that I learned was from my cousin. I have a cousin who's probably, oh, about 25 to 30 years older than me. And all while I was growing up, he worked for a vending company. Not only did he have his own TV shop, he, he worked for a vending company and worked on jukeboxes and pinball machines and video games and so forth. So that's kind of what I learned on growing up. And he had one of these just like this, no case on it, sitting up in the rafters of, of the ceiling, kind of in a little shelf, makeshift shelf with a big 12 inch speaker. And that was the radio that they listened to for many years uh, up in the ceiling, if I recall correctly. And uh, I've always wanted one. So the other thing my friend found along with this was an original Sam's Photo Fact. And this is not a copy. This is an original one uh, back from 1958. And that was pretty cool. Just, I mean, of course, you can download these things and print them, but it's really cool to have an original document. So on the first unit here, we look underneath and there you can tell it has been worked on. There is some service that's been done to it. One of the things I notice over here, you can see the hook and pinch on this capacitor right here. You can see right there where they hooked and pinched. And you can see these two capacitors right here that have been spliced in. So these have been replaced. Uh, we can see that there's some rust and corrosion on this the, for the uh, RF section. I don't know why, but that's probably going to need to be cleaned properly. And I also noticed down in here, I don't know how well you can see it, but you can see some crud down inside this tube socket and you can see how corroded this is. So this had some moisture in it at some point in time. And you can see here and here, these are, this is a really modern repair. So we'll go through and we'll clean all that up, but uh, by and large, it's in very good condition. So as small and simple as this receiver may seem on the outside, this can actually turn into quite a substantial job to properly restore one. And that's what we intend to do on this. Looking down in the RF, it doesn't look too bad, but this box is really corroded. So it's going to have to take a dip in the uh, evapo rust and get cleaned up. And then the evapo rust will eat whatever little bit of nickel plating there was on there. So we'll have to treat that with something so it doesn't rust again. And this I'm not going to put in the evapo rust because it's soldered in there very tightly and it has these little through through ways and everything. So we're going to leave this in place and just clean it as best we can. So one of the first things I noticed about this was it had a pretty particularly musty smell to it when I opened it up. And of course with all the rust on that cover and uh, all of these little tarnishes, which I've been kind of going through the mold and kind of cleaning it off with some alcohol. So I have some anhydrous isopropyl and if you look down here at this one's all covered with I don't know if we can zoom in a little bit right in here and if you just take some anhydrous isopropyl alcohol probably just plain old denatured would work too you can see it takes it right off but 
anytime you see things like that and there's just little areas of tarnish like this you may want to consider checking some of the resistors because these resistors these carbon comp resistors do not like being in a damp environment and a lot of times they can drift pretty substantially even though they look totally clean I mean you look how clean this looks under here but the resistors can still drift so let's take a look here I'll move them kind of get you in range to see the meter and let's just take a look at a couple of these resistors in here just to see what they look like hopefully we have the meter in view here and we'll check out a couple of these resistances so this first one uh, we have a couple of 270 ohm 2 watt resistors we want to make sure any of the higher powered resistors are accurate and you can see this one's high 330 ohms this one has a lot of tarnish on it you could see really bad and I, this is after I cleaned it and it's going to be actually, actually it's within tolerance 282 ohms so that one's okay now you may be reading through other things and capacitors so this isn't always the greatest way to go through and check things but so there's a 1k is reading 1.1k 6.8k let's see yeah that's reading across something and here's a 680 ohm that one's pretty close this one's a 5% tolerance and it's a 3.9k and even though there's a cap in there that's kind of interfering with it a little bit you can see that it should never drift above that voltage even with the cap in there so that one's reading high I've now gone through all of the resistors in here and just using this little red paint pen just put a little red dot on all of the resistors that were out of tolerance now some of these were out of tolerance a little bit they were beyond the 10 percent or whatever the color you know tolerance band would say they were but some of them were way out uh, by a good margin so we're going to go in and replace all of the bad resistors at some point none of them look so bad that they would actually inhibit the unit from working at all but eventually during the restoration those ones will need to be replaced if we want to bring everything perfectly into spec again with vacuum tubes quite often you can be pretty far out of the parameters and everything will still work really well but any resistor that has drifted more than its 10 or 15 percent whatever out is bound to continue drifting and will just be a problem down the road if you don't replace it okay checking some of these electrolytic capacitors just to make sure that uh, we don't have any problems with those and this first one 100 microfarads at 50 volts decent this one's a 40 microfarad at 250 and it is bad it has high ESR uh, 25 microfarads it's totally bad this 25 it's totally bad uh, this multi-section capacitor all of those are good these cans are usually pretty good in in these Fisher receivers they're high quality and the insulated one is good so this one here is bad this one tests okay for now 
but it, that does that just means that the ESR is low. That doesn't mean that the capacitor won't leak at high voltages. It also doesn't mean that the capacitance is correct. So just like we normally like to do with these types of equipment, is we're just going to start out with a simple test of the transformer. So we're going to take the meter and set it on ohms. We're going to attach it across the power cord like that and make sure we got a good connection here. And you can see we have 15 ohms, so the power must be turned on. And we turn it off. So when you turn this on, you're reading across the input of the of the power transformer. So 12 ohms, that sounds about reasonable for the input. So we know it's not shorted. And if we take this with respect to chassis, you can see there's no shorts. So we know that at least the primary of the transformer should be good. So we should be able to connect this to our dim bulb tester and we should be able to connect to the filament and the high voltage and we should be able to read the secondary of the transformer. Now in order to do this, we don't want to apply power to the rest of the, of the circuit. So the two rectifier tubes, so this 5V4 and the 6X4, we're going to have them pulled out and then that's going to prevent the rest of the radio from powering up. It's only going to allow filament voltage to the filaments and the high voltage is just going to be on an empty pin of a socket. So let's connect it up and take a look. Okay, I have this just connected to a 40 watt dim bulb so it's going to be highly current limited. But we're going to turn this on and just see if it can produce B+. I'm connected right now to this, 10, this 50 ohm resistor with respect to ground and that should be our B+. And it should charge up slowly because this bulb is, like I said, it's only a 40 watt bulb. So let's see. And that bulb is really bright right now. It's not full brightness. Okay, and we're only getting about 50 volts uh, into the radio right now because of the bulb. And look at that, the vacuum tube is heating up. This is an indirectly heated uh, rectifier tube, so it's not going to come on right away. It has to warm up like the rest of the tubes. And you can see we're getting B+, and it's, it's slowly charging up. nice. So if you look over here and you look at the monitor there next to the dim bulb. So there's the bulb, there's the monitor, and you can see we have 43 volts and we have about 270 milliamps. You see that in there? So what we'll do now is I'm going to switch in another the bigger bulb and switch out this bulb. So I'm going to switch this one in and that one out. And we can see now we're getting about 60 volts and we're getting about 616 milliamps and our B plus is now up to almost 200 volts which is good and we're still current limiting. Now let's bring in our 40 watt bulb again. So now this is going to be about 150 watts. And you could see those bulbs really dimmed down pretty well. We're getting 75 volts into the radio. Our B plus is now up to 250 volts. Very nice. Everything's looking pretty good so far. And I'm thinking this is pretty good. 
So I'm going to let this cook for a little bit like this and make sure that none of the capacitors are going to start to run away with us. And what will happen is if one of the capacitors starts to fail uh, because it's, you know, they've been down for so long, you know, a lot of times when you power something up that hasn't been turned on for a long time, the capacitor will work at first and then eventually as it comes up it'll short out and fail. So the whole concept of reforming a capacitor that can certainly happen and you can do that in some cases but in other cases rather than reform the, the capacitors deform is what I'll say and they'll actually begin to short out and what will happen is the dim bulb will get brighter and you'll see that current on the current meter get higher it'll start to climb so if that stays stable at that current for a long time and doesn't change then we can switch in the last bulb and bring enough current to it to actually get this thing almost up to its full operating power so that's what I'm going to do and then we'll be right back okay it's been a while and you notice the we're still idling at 733 milliamps and our B plus has settled and pretty much stayed at 264 volts so now I'm going to switch in the last bulb and that should get our power up pretty substantially and you can see those bulbs get very dim and we have 98 volts which is still not your full 120 volts so we're still about 20 volts below maximum and we're drawing about one amp or 940 milliamps we should say and our B plus is sitting at 346 volts so everything should be enough that it should should being the key word there it should be able to make some sound so let's connect an antenna and my capacitor <laughs> decoupled test speaker on the bench we're not going to play this thing loud we don't really want to play it loud we just want to hear it play so let me get that hooked up all right we have a test speaker connected and bass and treble are turned up volume is all the way down we're set to AM and turning the volume knob I'm hearing absolutely nothing so the amplifier section is dead uh, I don't know if I'm missing more tubes no they're all in there so well that's something we may have to play with a little bit because we are not getting anything out of the out of the amplifier section and looking at the radio section I'm getting no meter de tuning meter deflection as well, so definitely still have some problems with a voltage somewhere. So there's no activity from either AM or FM, so let's switch over to the auxiliary. I'll go to auxiliary one, and that's going to be this right here, and I'm going to turn the volume up a little bit and just kind of touch it with this probe. I should get some noise. Oh yeah! I don't know if you can hear that. So yes, the amplifier is in fact working. Now the voltages are way low, so you're never going to get the gain out of it. But the amplifier works. It's the tuner that's dead, which doesn't surprise me. There may be a bad capacitor. There could be a bad vacuum tube. I didn't really test them. But we do have an amplifier that's working. So looking at this, we definitely have some bad, bad voltages. At this point here should be about 340 volts. And you can see it's only 111 and it's slowly creeping up. And it's, this has been on for like 5 or 10 minutes. And it's just ever so slowly creeping up. I think we have a bad capacitor somewhere or something. And on the other side up here, this should be about 140 volts. And it's only reading what 51 53 volts you can see so one thing I did notice was and it really doesn't matter but when they put this capacitor right here in I'm going to 
point at it with something other than my digits. So right here, this capacitor, the, the actual keys, the little shapes that define, you know, which section is what capacitance and so forth, they're out of order on, on this particular capacitor. So this is a different cap than the original schematics show. So the little shapes don't necessarily line up with the voltages. And you can see where I kind of printed this out <laughs> and was kind of scribbling notes all over it as I was measuring it, figuring out what each voltage and what each section was supposed to go to. So now that I have that figured out, it just looks like when they mounted the cap, they rotated it 180 degrees and put it in and kind of the wires are kind of flip-flopped. Okay, so here's this 10K resistor. And if you look on one side of the 10K, we should have 420 volts. On the other side of the 10K should be 340 volts. That's with all the tubes in place. And if you look on this side, I have my 430 volts. On this side of the 10K, I only have 173 and it started out at 130 and it just keeps creeping up and up and up. And the strange thing is I pulled the 12AX7 completely out in case that something in there was loading it down which essentially removes, see because the 340 volt source goes into this so section here and in this section here and it did not change anything. So we have the resistor replaced and we have this capacitor just cobbled up here. Calm down. <laughs> when I did that Kenwood TK80 video and I did afterwards I did the thing about upgrading the, the uh, power capacitor, the main capacitor, and I put that temporary cap out there, I thought I was going to have to resuscitate a couple of the viewers because they actually believed that I was going to leave it that way. That was just tacked in there temporarily for the experiment that we were showing on the video, but a lot of people thought that that was the way I kind of did my work there. So this is temporary, we're just testing it. And you can see just from sitting here, the voltage is kind of drifting up a little bit. So let's turn this on and let's see what we get. Hopefully it should go up to 200, what, uh, 340 volts is what we should get. Wow, look at that. 350. And then it should drop down as soon as the tubes warm up. Let's see what happens. There it goes. And you can see as our tubes are warming up, this should drop to somewhere around 340 volts or so, give or take. That is much more like it. So, yeah, it was either a bad resistor or it was a bad capacitor. Turn it off. Very good. I've tacked those wires back on now and removed our little temporary cap. And if you notice, remember when I had this one just floating here in free space, it was kind of charging itself up just sitting there. Look at this one. So I'm not holding out much hope, but again, let's experiment. Let's see what this does. <laughs> we may have let the smoke out of this cap now. I don't know. And you can see it's not going, oh, well, it would help to turn the power on. Never mind. Okay, try again. Yep, same thing, look at that. It's not, it's going really slow. So that capacitor section is bad. I don't want to damage my new resistor. So it was a bad capacitor. And uh, I would say that all of these caps are probably on their way out, so I'm not going to go any further. I do think that that's all that's wrong with this radio at this point in time. I did some spot checks on some of the other things. I think, really, if we recap this thing it, and then replace all the out-of-tolerance resistors, I think this thing's going to come right in. Now that we have some voltage, 
let's see if we have anything coming through the tubes. So I have, the first thing I have here is I have the signal generator, let's look up here, set to 700 kilohertz. I have a really strong 500 microvolt signal and then I'm just using my radiating loop over there just kind of draped over the ferrite antenna and we're set to AM and we're gonna look right here at our first RF amplifier so see there so we're gonna look at the output right here on pin 5 with our signal tracer and we're going to just kind of see if we can tune in uh, something here let's see open one and I can just hear something now right there see so you can see we can tune it in and if I go to the output of that transformer so we're so we have it right here and let's now let's go over to here and see it should be weaker because it's on the other side of that transformer and we have it and then from there it goes into the AM converter tube which is right here so pin 5 of V4 I should see something so let's see where is V4 if I can find V4 let's see I have to get the chart open V4 is the second one down at the bottom so V4 is down here so if I go to right pin 5 which is right there which goes up to here oh yeah we got action so coming out of the converter right here we have it from there it goes up and it goes into this next transformer and we should be able to look at V5's output so V5 happens to be which tube is that? Right in here somewhere, right up here. So I should be able to go into pin 5 of that one and get an output of some sort. So let's see here. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 is this red wire, which is up here. And you can see we have a signal, but it's a little bit quieter. So it's louder down here. It's quieter up here. But we are getting it. So, long story short, it looks like our tuner is working. And I'm still not getting anything out to the speaker. But this is a good start. So now I'm kind of of the opinion that the tuner works we have some dirty vacuum tube sockets and we didn't check the FM but I'm pretty sure it's probably going to mostly work as well and really we're down to just doing the recap on this thing so because I have such a long wait for those parts to come in I'm going to post this video as a part one and at least we know that we tested this out we know it works and we got it to a point where we know what we need to do so let's end this video here we'll get something posted because it's been a while since I got a video up and uh, as always I'm going to wish you peace joy happiness and good health in your lives and I'm going to thank all of you for the donations and for all of your kind words I appreciate it and I look forward to uh, getting back on this as soon as some parts come in so until then we will see you and stay well. Take care. Bye-bye.